you know me, I'm the teacher. I love to teach. And uh, I got a fun one for you this morning. We're going to finish Ruth today. And, uh, of course, the book of Ruth is four chapters. I say they're some of the best four chapters in the entire Bible. Um, there's a... The, the book of Ruth is called a book about the kinsman redeemer. Uh, a lot of people don't understand that term. Um, every family has got a peacemaker in it. Every family. And uh, that peacemaker usually is also a redeemer, a person who tries to redeem relationships. And tries to bring a relationship back to where it's supposed to be. Uh, Lauren Daigle's got a song out right now that's very just cut and dried. And uh, she said the reason she wrote the song that way was because she had a family member who was struggling horribly. And she was trying to get her to see God in everything. To see God in the moment. And to try to get her to see that was really hard. But that song captures that. And uh, which shows you what about Lauren Daigle? She's, she's a kinsman redeemer. She's a family redeemer. She's a person who, who wants to see her family whole. And uh, so what's interesting is the kinsman redeemer is also a picture of Jesus. He's the ultimate kinsman redeemer. You know, what did he say on the cross? Father, don't hold this against them. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Right? That's what that means. Why does he say that? Because he's literally taking the place of our sin debt. And uh, one of the reasons I think that this book is so fun is that uh, Jesus is, or Boaz, Ruth and Boaz, and their son Obed is in the lineage of David, which makes him in the lineage of Jesus. Right. Once again, the fun part of that is, is Jesus is always including a Gentile somewhere, which is us. And Ruth is a Gentile and he includes her in his own lineage, which shows the ultimate redemption to me. Um, so anyway, uh, just to kind of sum the story up, uh, Elimelech was Naomi's husband. Elimelech decided to leave the land when there was a famine. God told him not to leave. God told him to stay put. He didn't do that. Within a year, after moving to Moab, after moving out into a place that he shouldn't have been, he's dead. Ten years later, his sons both die. And these two daughter-in-laws are left with their mother-in-law, Naomi, and... Uh, they're left with this battle. Do I follow the God of Naomi? Do I move back with Naomi or do I stay put in my own land? Do I stay where I'm at? And uh, Orpah decides to stay in her own land. Ruth decides to go where her mother-in-law is going. And what does she say? I will go where you go. I will live where you live. I will, your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. Where you die, I will die. And what I want you to see in that, I want you to see something that you begin to see in Ruth. Ruth is obviously introduced to God through Naomi. Maybe through her, her husband, but I think it's more through Naomi. And Ruth has got this thing. Ruth is a very obedient person. Once she gave her heart to God, she was in all the way. And she was going to follow him no matter what. And you see that throughout the book of Ruth. Well, once uh, Naomi moves back to Bethlehem or Ephratah, which is a suburb of Bethlehem, once she moves back there, uh, Ruth decides to go to work. You know, normally in a situation like that, the mother-in-law would ask the daughter-in-law to go to work after she set some kind of an agreement up with somebody to work for. Because remember, Ruth is a foreigner. She doesn't know anybody here. But instead, what you see with Ruth is Ruth takes the initiative. See, just like a Christian, when we become a follower of Christ, we begin to take the initiative on our own faith and in action, right? 
So in doing so, she wins the favor of Boaz, the guy who owns the land. Come to find out he's a kinsman redeemer, which means he's the only guy who can actually buy Elimelech's land, which is now Naomi's land. And the whole reason he, has to, he wants to buy it is not for his own gain. He buys the land so that Naomi will have sustenance, money, to live off of the next 30 years, right? That's the whole reason he's buying it. He doesn't need it. He was making money long before this came along. So all of a sudden you see this other thing go on, this kinsman redeemer, this Boaz, he's also a very obedient guy. And I want you to see that. Now, uh, we get in, uh, there's actually uh, sort of a, I don't want to be clinical about it, but it's a, like a mating ritual in the Hebrew custom, which is a certain way that a woman approaches a man and the man approaches a woman. And in doing that, uh, you see this whole thing in chapter 3 at the threshing floor where Naomi uncovers, or uh, Ruth uncovers Boaz's feet. She lays at his feet, which basically means I'm giving myself to you if you will accept me. Boaz takes him up, takes her up on that and basically says, you know what, I'm going to take care of this tomorrow. And so that's where we get into chapter four. This is where Boaz actually becomes the kinsman redeemer. Now watch this. Boaz went to the town gate and took a seat there. Just then the family redeemer he had mentioned came by. See, there was one that was closer to Naomi than he was. So Boaz called out to him, come over here and sit down, my friend. I want to talk to you. So they sat down together. Then Boaz called 10 leaders from the town and asked them to sit as witnesses. And Boaz said to the family redeemer, you know Naomi, who came back from Moab? She is selling the land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. I thought I should speak to you about it so that you can redeem it if you wish. If you want the land, then buy it here in the presence of these witnesses. But if you don't want it, let me know right away, because I am next in line to redeem it after you. The man replied, all right, I'll redeem it. Then Boaz told him, of course, your purchase of the land from Naomi also requires that you marry Ruth, the Moabite widow. That way she can have children who will carry on her husband's name and keep the land in the family. Now remember last week I described this. What happens is, is when Ruth has a little boy, she could have a half a dozen daughters, but until she has a little boy, that land does not pass forward. And what the kinsman redeemer does is he buys the land, puts it in trust, and when that boy becomes of age, he inherits all that land, and now that land goes right back to him. Now I want you to see that, because here's the deal. It looks like the kinsman redeemer doesn't benefit at all from this. Well, he does benefit in one way for about 20 years, because it takes about 20 years for this child to come of age, right? For 20 years, he makes money off the land. So even though he's buying the land and putting it in trust, he's actually making money off the land the whole time. So he has an interest in it himself. But what's interesting in this whole kinsman redeemer thing is, he's actually buying the land, putting it in trust for the son to be able to take care of his mother. You see that? Now I want you to see something that happened on the cross. Remember Jesus called John up to him and said, John. John says, yes, sir. He says, behold your mother. What did John do? From that day forward, he took care of Mary, the mother of Jesus. That's a kinsman redeemer. See, so when you begin to explore this kinsman redeemer, it's all over the Bible. And it is... Personally, it affects us because the way salvation works is somebody has to take the place for your sin. Jesus, ultimate kinsman redeemer, takes the place for our sin, buys our place in heaven, and then sets it aside and lets it sit there until we die. And then we receive whatever it is he's given. You see how that kinsman redeemer thing works? Okay, so 
All right, then, I'll redeem it. Then Boaz says, of course, your purchase of the land of Naomi from the land from Naomi also requires that you marry Ruth the Moabite widow. That way she can have children who will carry on her husband's name and keep the family, keep the land in the family. Then I can't redeem it, the family redeemer replied, because this might endanger my own estate. You redeem the land, I cannot do it. Now, some people would go, well, he's awful selfish here. Why didn't he just redeem the land? Well, obviously he's married. Obviously he already has some level of commitment to his own children, right? This is why I believe Boaz, it never says it outright, but this is why I believe Boaz is a bachelor. Boaz doesn't have any problem marrying Ruth because he has nobody to give his land to. You see that? When he dies, there's nobody to pass it on to except another kinsman redeemer. How much better it would be if he could give the land to family. Now what's crazy is, is the minute that this child is born, it's actually not Boaz's son. It's as if Malon, Ruth's husband, has just birthed, helped her birth a son. But because he's a kinsman redeemer, it's as if he's adopted this son. So there's so much symbolism in here that it goes right back to the cross and what Jesus did for us. It is in, unbelievable. So he says, I cannot, he says, you redeem the land, I cannot do it. Now in those days, it was the custom in Israel for anyone transferring a right <coughs> of passage to remove his sandal and hand it to the other party. This publicly validated the transaction, so the other family redeemer drew off his sandal as he said to Boaz, you buy the land. Now, a little funny here, I don't know that that necessarily means that he walked away with three sandals. Or he walked away with two sandals that didn't match. But it means that it was part of the transaction. Now, in America, for 200 years, the way we did a transaction, Michelle, that right there meant my word is my bond. Nowadays, that doesn't hardly mean nothing. You know what's crazy? I've only signed a contract maybe twice in my entire life. I've been in business as a carpenter for 40 years. Twice I signed a contract. Every other time. Just like this. That's the way it was done. That's the same as handing that sandal. Okay? So when you see things like this in Scripture, it doesn't mean you can't understand it. You just got to have something to relate to. Okay? Then Boaz said to the elders and to the crowd standing around, You are witnesses that today I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon. That's the two sons. And with the land I have acquired Ruth, the Moabite widow of Malon, to be my wife. This way she can have a son to carry on the family name of her dead husband and to inherit the family property here in his hometown. You are all witnesses today. Then the elders and all the people standing in the gate replied, We are witnesses. May the Lord make this woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah. Now, why does he say this? Do you know where Rachel died? Rachel is the, the daddy or the mama of Joseph and Benjamin, two of the 12 sons. Leah was the mother of the other 10 sons. Her and a helpmate. Well, guess where Rachel is from? Ephrata. Isn't that ironic? Not only is she from Ephrata, it says in the scripture that during the time of Jesus when the babies were killed, remember that? When he was first born? It said Rachel will be heard crying for her children. It's because she was from Bethlehem, Ephrata. Okay? All of this stuff ties together. It is so fascinating when you really look at it. May you prosper in Ephrata and be famous in Bethlehem. 
And may the Lord give you descendants by this young woman who is like those of our ancestor Perez, the son of Tamar and Judah. So Boaz took Ruth into his home, and she became his wife. When he slept with her, the Lord enabled her to become pregnant, and she gave birth to a son. Then the women of the town said to Naomi, Praise the Lord who has now provided a redeemer for your family. May this child be famous in Israel. Do you see that? Now, whenever it says something like that in Scripture, it means any of their descendants be famous. It doesn't just mean that person. Guess who this child's grandson is? David, the king. Whose son is offspring after that? Solomon, the greatest king that was ever known. So this blessing goes directly to this family. May he restore your youth and care for you in your old age, for he is the son of your daughter-in-law who loves you and has been better to you than seven sons. Naomi took the baby and cuddled him to her breast, and she cared for him as if he was her own. The neighbor women said, Now at last Naomi has a son again, and they named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse and the grandfather of David. This is a genealogical direct record of their ancestry. Now, what was fascinating to me is I, I, whenever I study anything like this, I always say, God, okay, I get it, I get it. Thank you for showing me all this stuff. But I always ask him, show me something I haven't seen before. So guess what? I got to looking at this name Obed over and over and over and over. And one day God says, one day this week God says, Obed, it means obedience. And I went, oh my gosh, Ruth is one of the most obedient women in the entire Bible. Boaz is one of the most obedient men in the entire Bible. So I googled Obed. I googled it. it first word that pops up, Obed. Second word that pops up, obedience. Third word pops up, obedient. And I went, oh my gosh. Isn't that cool? Well, check this out. Who is the most obedient person that ever lived? Jesus. Who is Jesus a descendant of? Obed. Obedience. And I got to thinking about that. You know, Jesus said to obey is better than sacrifice. And this is kind of the sermon I want to say to you today. I'm starting to notice in the last couple of weeks my sermons... Everything else is information, and then my sermon is like two sentences long. So here's the sermon. Here's the sermon. When we have a tendency to try to measure up to God, we always think we have to do something. And so we go out of our way to try to do something big. Everybody always says, I just don't know what God has called me to do. Are you a husband? Then he's called you to be a husband. Are you a wife? Then he's called you to be a wife. Are you friends to people who are down and out? Then he's called you to be friends to people who are down and out. It doesn't mean you're supposed to be the president. It doesn't mean you're supposed to be the preacher. It doesn't mean that you go into this sacrificial thing and go, oh, I'm going to become a nun. And so you go into all the things that it takes to do that. It doesn't mean you go, oh, I, I think I need to become a priest. That way I'll please God. No. He's just asking you to be obedient. I've noticed that whenever a person gets saved and they start looking around, what is it I'm supposed to be doing? They're usually already doing it. They're helping somebody, they're mowing somebody's yard, they're doing something because all of a sudden they have this full heart full of God and they just want to please God. Well, they're already doing it half the time, but then they start looking for things that are big. There's a song out by, uh, I think it's Josh Wilson or Jason Gray right now, it's called Dream Small. That's a hard one for Americans. Dream Small. 
He says, God shows up in the small things that you do. It's not this big grandiose thing that we set our sights on and try to do. It's the little things that we do. Helping your neighbor every day, right? I'm one of those guys. I happen to be the guy that's the last one to leave the house on Monday morning. You know what one of the things that I do is? Now this is silly, simple, no big deal. I take everybody's trash can and I roll it back to their house. Why? I'm the last neighbor to leave. The trash truck has already come by rather than the trash can sitting out in the street all day. I just roll them up to the neighbor's yard. Do you know nobody thanks me for that? Nobody says, good job, Jim. Nobody pats me on the back. No, most of them don't even know who does it. They just know, wait a minute, did I? I must have rolled that back. Well, what does it matter? It matters because it's something good. And it's simple. And I do it because I love to honor my neighbors. It's that simple. I got a neighbor that every now and then just forgets to mow their lawn or they get busy or whatever. You know what? I'm mowing. I already got the mower out. Just mow the yard. It's not that big a deal. And every now and then they'll stop and go, hey, you didn't have to do that. I know that. Have a good day. Those things are just as important as the things that we think are grandiose. Oh, I haven't given my tithe this week. I, I got to make sure and give every penny of it or else God's not going to bless me. That's not, that's not the way all this works. The way this works is be obedient to the things that he's asking you to do. Just do them as simple as they are, right? That's what I wanted you to see today. And I, I think it's, you know, what's interesting about this. I told Michelle, it's not a coincidence that Obed in English is the root word to obedience. It's not a coincidence. The word Obed actually means worshiper. Now, chase that rabbit a minute. If you're going to really be a worshiper, you got to be obedient. <laughs> it's more than just praise with your mouth, right? So anyway, I wanted you to be thinking about those things, and I was fascinated with the, the name Obed. Thank you guys for being here. If anybody needs to come pray, I want you to do that.